For the thermal physics review, I will just cover things not in the notes I prepared. You can download these notes at my website. For volume expansion, we did problems like this. We have cup filled with water to the brim and then we either heat it up or cool it down. Usually the beta for water is higher than the beta of cup, which means that when we heat it up, the water is going to expand more than the cup, therefore water would overflow. Or if we cool it down, water is going to contract more than the cup, so the water level is going to go down and therefore we can fill more water into the cup. If we want to find the, how much water overflows when we heat, it the, heat this whole thing up, or how much water we can add into the cup when we cool this whole thing down. What we can do is uh, to look at the, the difference of beta because the reason why we have water overflow or we have space to fill in water is because they have different volume expansion. So this is what we want to find. Therefore, this will be the beta difference the larger beta minus the smaller beta times the original volume times the change in temperature. For the translational kinetic theory of ideal gas, we learned that the average translational kinetic energy is one half m times the root mean square speed squared, which is three halves kT. And this is the average per molecule. Therefore, the total translational kinetic energy would be the average times the number of molecules. So this is 3 halves nKT, which is 3 halves nRT, which is 3 halves PV. So we'll find this useful later on when we work on first law problems because the total ki translational kinetic energy is uh, the total kinetic energy if uh, we're talking about the monatomic ideal gas. So if you remember for those first law problems, for monatomic ideal gas, we can use delta U equals to the change in 3 halves PV because a monatomic ideal gas only has translational kinetic energy. Unlike diatomic ideal gas, they can have translational kinetic energy and they can have vibrational and rotational kinetic energy. So a diatomic ideal gas would have more total kinetic energy than this. However, for monatomic ideal gas, 3 halves PV is all of the kinetic energy a monatomic ideal gas has. Another thing is that the number of molecules goes with the K, the Boltzmann's constant. The number of moles goes with the R, the gas constant. So over here, if we have one half mass of a molecule times the root mean square speed squared, it will this average translational kinetic energy per molecule would equal to 3 halves kT. However, if we use a molar mass over here, that means that this is the average translational kinetic energy per mole, then it becomes 3 halves RT. So if it's a molar mass, it goes with R. If it's a, the mass of one molecule, it goes with the K. For a PV diagram, Every point on a PV diagram is a state. For example, if I have two states and I want to compare the temperature of those two states because uh, PV equals to nRT, for the same gas, the number of moles is the same, the R is the same. That means uh, the temperature of that gas is proportional to T times V. So all we have to do is to compare P times V, the one with the higher P times V is the one with the higher temperature. The first law says that the, the change in internal energy of a gas equals to heat added to the gas plus the work done on the gas. If we take a gas from state 1 to state 2 following three different paths, the delta U would all be the same because U is a function of state. So delta U does not depend on the path it takes. The delta U is just the final U minus the initial U. But the Q 
does depend on the path and W depends on the path. And uh, to find the W, we can just look at the area under the graph. So a different path would have different area underneath. Since the delta U is supposed to be the same for different paths, if W is different, that means the Q must also be different. So both Q and W <coughs> depends on the path, but the delta U does not. The work done on the gas is positive if the volume decreases. It's negative if the volume increases. Because if we have a gas, let's say we compress it this way with a force pushing down, and then the volume decreases because the piston goes down. The work done by this external agent on the gas is positive because the external agent's force and the displacement, they are in the same direction. So the work done by this force is positive. If instead the gas expands, that means the piston goes up. So force goes down, displacement goes up. That means uh, this force would do negative work. Now let's look at these special processes. The isothermal path is the AB. Because the isothermal means temperature is the same, and uh, it's PV equals to nRT. If the temperature is a constant, that means uh, P times V is a constant. That means uh, if the pressure becomes one third, the volume would triple. So if the pressure becomes one third, the volume would triple. That's why it's A to B or B to A, depending on whether the volume is increasing or volume is decreasing. For isobaric, the pressure is a constant. So it's D to B or B to D. Isochoric means the volume is a constant. So it's either A to D or D to A. For adiabatic process, it is AC. It looks like a kind of like isothermal curve, but it is steeper than the isothermal path. Because by definition, adiabatic means there's no heat exchange. Q is zero. So for example, if uh, it's an adiabatic expansion, the volume increases. According to the first law, delta U would equal to Q plus uh, the work done on the gas. If the volume increases, the work done on the gas would be a negative number. And the Q is zero because it's an adiabatic process. That means that delta U must be negative. U, the internal energy, only depends on the temperature. So if the internal energy decreases, delta U being negative means U, the internal energy decreases, means the temperature decreases. So an adiabatic expansion must end with a lower temperature than, of course, the isothermal curve, because the isothermal process does not have temperature change. C has a lower temperature than B because C has a smaller P times V than B. I didn't really talk about the heat engines on the nodes, so let me do that now. A heat engine is an engine that works between a high temperature and a low temperature. And it uses the fact that the heat would uh, flow spontaneously from high temperature to the low temperature. But it, the engine would pull some of that heat out and use that heat to do work. This part is uh, the heat engine. So QH is the heat that flows into the heat engine, and the, the QL is the heat that flows out of the heat engine. And uh, the work is the work that's done, performed by the heat engine. And uh, because of the energy conservation, since QH split into these two, so QH equals to QL plus W. QH is the heat that enters the engine. So the QH is the heat that we have to provide. And the QL is the heat that comes out of the heat engine. So QL is the heat that comes out with the exhaust. QL is the heat, sometimes we say the heat produced by the heat engine. The efficiency of a heat engine is defined as the work it performs divided by the energy we have to provide, the QH. And because of energy conservation, so W is QH minus QL. So this will also be that. 
if we have an ideal engine or a carnal engine, the ideal efficiency would still be this, but it also equals to an equation that's very similar to that, except for instead of Q, we would use the temperature. And uh, we didn't derive this equation in this course. But you should know that this is uh, the ideal efficiency for a heat engine or carnal efficiency for the heat engine. It depends on the two temperatures. No heat engines can be more efficient than a carnal engine. To complete the review, please be sure to read through the notes and find a few practice problems to do.